welcome. Isn't it wonderful to be back at Holland's? My name is Linda Koch Lorimer, class of 1974, and I have the privilege of being a member of the Board of Trustees and the convener of this session. You know, we all know, Hollands has been about innovation for 175 years. Since that 19-year-old Charles Lewis Koch declared that he would devote his life to the revolutionary idea of educating women. And others here have been a part of this almost two centuries of innovation. A number of you were in the pioneering classes for Holland's Abroad, one of the nation's first international abroad programs. And indeed, we're here this afternoon for one of our greatest innovations, our graduate program in creative writing. The master's program now is an MFA, and I think most of us really don't recognize its incredible legacy. Four Pulitzer Prizes have been awarded to our graduates including one to Natasha Trothaway, who we'll be hearing from today, and one to Holland's College. <laughs> and one to Holland's College and master's graduate, Annie Dillard, who is right here for her reunion. Annie, please. We all know that she won the Pulitzer for Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, which she wrote right here. Uh, but you may not know that in 2014, President Obama presented her with one of the National Humanities Medals for, quote, her profound reflection on human life and nature in poetry and prose. Annie, welcome home. go on and on to offer a who's who's of esteemed Holland's writers, but I think this one sentence in an article in the New York Times captures it well. Quote, sometimes one begins to think that the faculty and graduates of Holland's supply half the world's books. <laughs> certainly they supply, the Times continued, certainly they supply many of the best ones. <laughs> Holland's tradition of writing and literature is not limited to our wonderful graduate program. Most every alum here recalls magnificent teachers who made us better writers, better readers, and I would hazard, in many cases, better people. For me, it was Richard Dillard, who brought alive American literature on afternoons in Bradley. And for so many of you I know, we had Louis Rubin, who made a similarly indelible mark on your lives. And the alumni here for the last alumni here for the last three decades have had Jeannie Larson, Kathy Hankla, and Tahash, uh, Natasha's late father, who was on our faculty. Now, the reputation of great undergraduate teaching continues. USA Today, perhaps not as noble a publication as the New York Times, but I will quote it for this reason, you'll understand, in their various college rankings last fall, named Hollins as the number one college in the nation in the category English Language and Literature General. Now, I will say that even sounds to a Holland's booster like me a bit inflated, but I do think it speaks to the recognition of our university. The afternoon on this topic cannot pass without a real thanks of, to Susan Gaynor Jackson, class of 68, and her husband John, whose $5 million gift recently created the Jackson Center for Creative Writing, which serves both undergraduates and graduate students. They were certainly going to be here, but at the last minute had to change their plans. So we thank them in absentia. This afternoon, we're fortunate to hear from two alums who epitomize Holland's tradition of notable writers, one a graduate of the master's program and one a graduate of the college. Natasha Trethaway is a 1991 graduate of our master's program, and a current Holland's trustee, I'm pleased to say, fitting that into her incredible schedule. She served not one but two terms as the 19th Poet Laureate of the United States. She spent the last 16 years as a Woodward Professor of English and Creative Writing at Emory University, where she has directed that program. And she's just moved to Northwestern University this summer to lead a new creative writing master's program there. She was awarded her Pulitzer in 2007 for poetry for her book, Native Guard. 
When the Librarian of Congress, James Billington, appointed Natasha in 2012 as Poet Laureate for the Nation, he said, quote, after hearing Natasha's poetry at the National Book Festival, I was immediately struck by a kind of classic quality with a richness and variety of structures with which she presents her poetry. She intermixes her story with the historical story in a way that takes you deep into the human tragedy of it. Our second alumna is Lee Smith, who is back to celebrate her 50th reunion. During her There's so many wonderful Lee Smith stories, but I always have liked this one, that during her senior uh, year at Hollins, she submitted an early draft of a novel to the Book of the Month Club competition. Some of you young ones don't know how significant the Book of the Month Club used to be in our life. <laughs> that she got a fellowship, and a year after graduating from Hollins, that novel was published. She since penned 12 more novels, as, four, as well as four collections of short stories. She's received so many awards, the Robert Penn Warren Award for Fiction, and two of Henry Awards among them. Those of us who love Hollands, love how Lee has lovingly showcased our college in her books, most recently in Dinosaur, but also The Last Girls, where basically it was all about Hollands women. <laughs> Annie Dillard has written that Lee, quote, that Lee's wide warmth blesses everything funny about life and everything moving and deep. I think we'll hear that this afternoon. Finally joining us is another alumna of our graduate program in creative writing, Jean Larson, who's been a Holland's faculty member for 37 years. She is an exceptional teacher. <laughs> an exceptional teacher, as many in this audience uh, uh, have had an experience. She's also an incredible citizen and a very productive author herself having published three collections of poems, four novels, including the very popular Silk Road, and two volumes of literary translations. So we have a treat in the next hour. Natasha and Lee will each give a short reading of their work, then Jean will pose a few questions to kick off a conversation with them. Thank you so much for being here. Good afternoon. It is so lovely to be here with you on this lovely weekend and to share the stage with Lee and my former professor, Jean. In his memorial to William Butler Yeats, W.H. Auden wrote, Mad Ireland hurt you into poetry. Likewise, my South, my Mississippi with its brutal history of racial violence and oppression inflicted my first existential wound. My second, deeper wound, indeed my calling to be a poet, was losing my mother when I was 19. If those two things hurt me into poetry, Hollins taught me to shape my grief, to develop my craft, and to find the eloquent, elegant and eloquent language to write what was given me to write. As Rumi put it, the wound is the place where the light enters you. I learned to live a writing life here, to be a writer. One of the ways that I did that, halfway through my time here, having come thinking that I loved stories, I loved narratives so much that I wanted to be a fiction writer, I found that I was a poet instead. And Jean Larson challenged me to, halfway through the year, to complete my MA, my MA thesis in poetry, to write more poems outside of my regular classes, and she met with me each week to discuss those poems. I think I wouldn't have made it through if she hadn't done that. Now, some of you may know that my father, Eric Trekaway, was a poet um, and a professor here for a very long time. He and my mother met at Kentucky State College, now Kentucky State University, which is one of the historically black colleges and universities. That may sound odd because my father is white. Uh, he, he found his way to Kentucky State from Canada, where he met my mother. He didn't know it was a black college when he signed up and got a track scholarship. He told 
told a wonderful story about leaving home in Canada with this big fisherman sweater that his mother had knitted for him on with nothing uh, underneath, no t-shirt. So when he got to the south, he was dying of heat and he couldn't take it off because he was shirtless under it. Um, and so he fainted in line at the bursar's office and woke up with a ring of black faces looking down at him. I think that was a version of heaven. Now my mother's story is a little different. My mother tells this story about meeting my father. I know that they were in an English class together, but her story was about the first moment she remembers laying eyes on him. And that was, uh, it was during the time that the Righteous Brothers had come out with this song, You Lost That Love and Feeling. And all the women in my mother's dorm assumed, these were all black women, they assumed that these men with such beautiful, deeply soulful voices had to be black. And they were coming on a variety show, and so all the women in my mother's dorm gathered around the television to watch the Righteous Brothers. And when these white guys came on singing, my mother said my father jogged by the window at that exact moment. <laughs> And here I am. <laughs> this is early evening, Frankfort, Kentucky. It is 1965. I am not yet born, only a fullness beneath the empire waist of my mother's blue dress. The ruffles at her neck are waves of light in my father's eyes. He carries a slim volume, leather-bound, poems to read as they walk. The long road past the college, through town, rises and falls before them, the blue hills shimmering at twilight. The stacks at the distillery exhale, and my parents breathe evening air heady and sweet as Kentucky bourbon. They are young and full of laughter, the sounds in my mother's throat rippling down into my blood. My mother, who will not reach 41, steps into the middle of a field, lies down among clover and sweet grass, right here, right now, dead center of her life. My parents' marriage was illegal at the time. And we often think of this as really ancient history, and yet it's not. Just in, 19, in the late 1990s, the state of Alabama voted to get rid of the anti-miscegenation laws. And though they did vote to get rid of them, 42% of the voting population voted to keep them, so that at least symbolically it could be said that parents like mine couldn't be married legally and people like me born legally in the state. Miscegenation. In 1965, my parents broke two laws of Mississippi. They went to Ohio to marry, returned to Mississippi. They crossed the river into Cincinnati, a city whose name begins with a sound like sin, the sound of wrong, miss in Mississippi. A year later, they moved to Canada, followed a route the same as slaves, the train slicing the white glaze of winter, leaving Mississippi. Faulkner's Joe Christmas was born in winter, like Jesus, given his name for the day he was left at the orphanage, his race unknown in Mississippi. My father was reading War and Peace when he gave me my name. I was born near Easter, 1966, in Mississippi. When I turned 33, my father said, it's your Jesus year. You're the same age he was when he died. It was spring, the hills green in Mississippi. I know more than Joe Christmas did, 
Natasha is a Russian name, though I'm not. It means Christmas child, even in Mississippi. Southern Gothic. I had lain down into 1970, into the bed my parents will share for only a few more years. Early evening, they have not yet turned from each other in sleep, their bodies curved, parentheses framing the separate lives they'll wake to. Dreaming, I am again the child with too many questions, the endless why and why and why. My mother cannot answer, her mouth closed, a gesture toward her future, cold lips stitched shut. The lines in my young father's face deepen toward an expression of grief. I have come home from the schoolyard with the words that shadow us in this small southern town. Peckerwood and nigger lover, half-breed and zebra, words that take shape outside us. We're huddled on the tiny island of bed, quiet in the language of blood, the house unsteady on its center block haunches, sinking deeper into the muck of ancestry. Oil lamps flicker around us, our shadows, dark glyphs on the wall, bigger and stranger than we are. This is a poem that is after a painting by Miguel Cabrera, his portrait of Saint Gertrude from 1763. Articulation. In the legend, Saint Gertrude is called to write after seeing in a vision the sacred heart of Christ. Cabrera paints her among the instruments of her faith quill, inkwell, an open book, rings on her fingers like Christ's many wounds, the heart emblazoned on her chest, the holy infant nestled there as if sunk deep in a wound. Against the dark backdrop, her face is a wafer of light. How not to see in the saint's image my mother's last portrait? The dark backdrop, her dress black as a habit, the bright edge of her afro ringing her face with light. And how not to recall her many wounds, ring finger shattered, her ex-husband's bullet finding her temple, lodging where her last thought lodged. Three weeks gone, my mother came to me in a dream, her body whole again, but for one perfect wound, the singular articulation of all of them, a whole center of her forehead, the size of a wafer, light pouring from it. How then could I not answer her life with mine, she who saved me with hers? And how could I not, bathed in the light of her wound, find my calling there? Imperatives for carrying on in the aftermath. Do not hang your head or clench your fists when even your friend after hearing the story, says, my mother would never put up with that. Fight the urge to rattle off statistics that, more often, a woman who chooses to leave is then murdered. The hundredth time your father says, but she hated violence, why would she marry a guy like that? 
Don't waste your breath explaining again how abusers wait, are patient, that they don't beat you on the first date, sometimes not even the first few years of a marriage. Keep an impassive face whenever you hear, stand by your man, and let go your rage when you recall those words were advice given your mother. Try to forget the first trial, before she was dead, when the charge was only attempted murder. Don't belabor the thinking or the sentence that allowed her ex-husband's release a year later, or the juror who said, it's a domestic issue, they should work it out themselves. Just breathe when, after you read your poems about grief, a woman asks, do you think your mother was weak for men? Learn to ignore subtext. Imagine a thought cloud above your head, dark and heavy, with the words you cannot say. Let silence rain down. Remember you were told by your famous professor that you should write about something else. Unburden yourself of the death of your mother and just pour your heart out in the poems. Ask yourself what's in your heart, that reliquary, blood locket and seed bed, and contend with what it means. The folk saying you learned from a Korean poet in Seoul, that one does not bury the mother's body in the ground, but in the chest, or like you, you carry her corpse on your back. I shouldn't have to say that that didn't happen at Holland's. I, I realize <laughs> that famous professor thing, um, only Holland's could have prepared me to deal with a professor that said that when I went on to further my education at the next place. That's why I could, these years later, write that poem, too. I'm going to finish with two poems now. To write this last book uh, of mine, uh, I had to take my father back to Monticello. He took me there the first time uh, over 25 years ago. A lot of things have changed at Monticello. It is now the official position that Thomas Jefferson fathered several of Sally Hemings' children. Whereas it used to be taboo even to bring Sally Hemings up, now the docent will mention that when the tour begins. Because of that, the kinds of conversations you overhear at Monticello have changed, though the subtext remains the same. Enlightenment. In the portrait of Jefferson that hangs at Monticello, he is rendered two-toned, his forehead white with illumination, a lit bulb, the rest of his face in shadow, darkened as if the artist meant to contrast his bright knowledge, its dark subtext. By 1805, when Jefferson sat for the portrait, he was already linked to an affair with his slave. Against a backdrop blue and ethereal, a wash of paint that seems to hold him in relief, Jefferson gazes out across the centuries, his lips fixed as if he's just uttered some final word. The first time I saw the painting, I listened as my father explained the contradictions, how Jefferson hated slavery, though, out of necessity, my father said, had to own slaves. That his moral philosophy meant he could not have fathered those children would have been impossible, my father said. For years, we debated the distance between word and deed. I'd follow my father from book to book, gathering citations, listen as he named, like a field guide to Virginia, each flower and tree and bird, as if to prove a man's pursuit of knowledge is greater than his shortcomings, the limits of his vision. I did not know then the subtext of our story, 
that my father could imagine Jefferson's words made flesh in my flesh, the improvement of the blacks in body and mind in the first instance of their mixture with the whites, or that my father could believe he'd made me better. When I think of this now, I see how the past holds us captive, its beautiful ruin etched on the mind's eye. My young father, a rough outline of the old man he's become, needing to show me the better measure of his heart, an equation writ large at Monticello. That was years ago. Now we take in how much has changed. Talk of Sally Hemings, someone asking, how white was she? Parsing the fractions as if to name what made her worthy of Jefferson's attentions. A near white quadroon mistress, not a plain black slave. Imagine stepping back into the past, our guide tells us then. And I can't resist whispering to my father, this is where we split up. I'll head around to the back. When he laughs, I know he's grateful I've made a joke of it. This history that links us, white father, black daughter, even as it renders us other to each other. Elegy for my father. I think by now the river must be thick with salmon. Late August, I imagine it as it was that morning. Drizzle needling the surface, mist at the banks like a net settling around us. Everything damp and shining. That morning, awkward and heavy in our hip waders, we stalked into the current and found our places, you upstream a few yards and out far deeper. You must remember how the river seeped in over your boots and you grew heavier with that defeat. All day I kept turning to watch you, how first you mind our guides casting, then cast your invisible line, slicing the sky between us. And later, rod in hand, how you tried again and again to find that perfect arc, flight of an insect skimming the river's surface. Perhaps you recall I cast my line and reeled in two small trout we could not keep. Because I had to release them, I confess I thought about the past, working the hooks loose, the fish writhing in my hands, each one slipping away before I could let go. I can tell you now that I try to take it all in, record it for an elegy I'd write one day when the time came. Your daughter, I was that ruthless. What does it matter if I tell you I learned to be? You kept casting your line, and when it did not come back empty, it was tangled with mine. Some nights, dreaming, I step again into the small boat that carried us out and watch the bank receding, my back to where I know we are headed. Thank you. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that reading. It's beautiful. And I think especially meaningful for those of us who knew your father, too. So um, let's see. I hear my classes. Okay. 
Um, I think I'm going to first read um, just a little piece I wrote about Mr. Rubin, as we all called him. My husband asked me this morning why we didn't call him Dr. Rubin. And I have no idea. We just all called him Mr. Rubin and, you know, Mr. Moore and the various misters with whom we, uh, with whom we studied. So let me just read this little piece, which was um, originally written, I think, for American Scholar for a, um, you know, a series that they had on teachers and teaching. The deepest thrills of my life have often come from writing a moment perfectly captured in the image of myself at 19, over 50 years ago, climbing up the steep, grassy hill which separated the campus of Hollins College from the line of small brick houses up on Faculty Row. I was headed to my creative writing workshop, held in the basement den of my professor Mr. Louis D. Rubin, Mr. Rubin, we always called him. It is that magical time of day in the beautiful Shenandoah Valley when night is falling all around me. The gloaming, a word I have just learned in my English poetry class. <laughs> As I climb upward through the gloaming, I press 15 mimeographed copies of the story I have just finished. Just finished writing it last night at 2 a.m. against my beating heart. That story is my beating heart. And I know even then, even in the very moment of it, climbing that hill to class, that I am as fully alive as I will ever be in my whole life long. This has turned out to be true. It is all due to Mr. Rubin who changed my life as he has changed so many others. Exactly what went on in that workshop, which I attended for three years? Who was there? Not only Mr. Rubin, wreathed in cigar smoke, dark eyes popping behind his black eyeglasses, but also about a dozen other undergraduate girls, including Cindy McKeithen, Franny Taylor, Baby Joe Beerson, Chris Edwards, Ann Dope Dillard, and Ann Bradford from our class. I know I'm forgetting people. And several graduate students, such as Rafe Jones, George Butler, Henry Taylor. Mr. Lex Allen was usually there, Mr. Allen, plus Julia Sawyer sitting on the floor. And often other faculty members who were also writers, real, active, published writers still alive. <laughs> Before Hollins, I had thought all published writers were dead. <laughs> and we were expected to critique their work in our workshop, too, just as we critiqued each other. Imagine that. Heady stuff. Mr. Rubin himself sometimes read us a story in progress or a new poem of his own. This was important. It meant that we mattered, that our opinions were important too, that we were all in this together. He never gave us writing assignments or prompts, as they are called now. He assumed that we were in that group because we had something to say. And so we did have something to say <laughs> because this workshop was a safe place. Nobody would ever be embarrassed or humiliated or put down. What needed to be said would be said, but gently, often with humor, in a way that the writer could hear it if she was ready to hear it or not. The theme would be discussed. What is this story really about? Often a big surprise to the writer. <laughs> there would be jokes, beer, Laughter. Writing was serious, but we should not take ourselves too seriously. An atmosphere I have tried to replicate since in every creative writing class or workshop I have ever taught. We were a gang, a cohort, a caress, and it didn't end there. 
He kept up with us for the rest of our lives, freely giving recommendations and advice which I especially needed as a wild girl prone to bad decisions. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rubin died at 89 several years ago. It's still hard for me to realize that he's gone now or that so many years have passed since I climbed that grassy hill in the gloaming which my with my story clutched to my heart. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would like to read you a little bit from an essay, which is in this book that um, I published last year named Dime Store, A Writer's Life, which is a, a memoir really in the form of essays. And my father, it's named Dime Store, because my father ran his dime store in Grundy, Virginia for 55 years. And um, I grew up, of course, working in the dime store. My job was the dolls from the time I was about five years old. But anyway, it's about Grundy, it's about Southwest Virginia, it's about a whole lot of things, including Hollands. And one of my favorite um, parts of it is the time that Mr. Rubin brought this funny looking old lady to class. We were, I was a sophomore, and I was very busy acting like a writer at that time. <laughs> I'd much rather act like a writer than write anything. And um, I was busy that day. I had a, I used to carry a guitar case around with no guitar because I thought it made me look more like a writer. And, and I had my guitar case and a six pack of beer. And I was, and I was going up to Carvin's Cove to kind of walk around in a moody way and look like a writer. But instead, I ran into Mr. Ribbon in the post office, and he said, well, he said, you're going you're gonna to enjoy class today. And so then I had to go to class, right? And of course, the guest was Judora Welty. And uh, I think I'll just tell this story instead. Of, and, and so it was Eudora Welty, and uh, there we are in the class. I had never heard of Eudora Welty. And she, the reason she had come to Hollins was because I think Mr. Rubin had engineered that she would win the Hollins Medal for literature. And he was sort of in the process of inventing Southern literature at that time. And there she was. And she just looked like every old woman in Grundy, Virginia. <laughs> that I was so disappointed because, I mean, she didn't have a guitar or even a guitar case <laughs> or a black sweater or anything. She looked like, you know, all my mother's friends that had those boiled kind of dresses that buttoned up the front. I'm, oh, no. So, but there we all are. We're in class and we're looking around. And the whole back of our class, the whole back of the classroom begins to fill up with people. Some of them boys. Because we didn't have very bo many boys on, you know, on campus at that point. And a lot of them looked like graduate students, maybe from somewhere like UVA you know, with kind of long hair and intense and everything. We never got to see those. And so, you know, and other faculty from other places, you know, other disciplines uh, in Hollins and also from other places. So, you know, we kind of perked up. And he introduced, Mr. Rubin introduced Miss Welty. And she said, well, I'm going to read you a story. And she had this for a Mississippian, a really fast voice, you know, a fast delivery and a wonderful, lilting, light kind of voice. And the story she read was, of course, one of the best stories ever written in the world, A Worn Path, the story of Miss Phoenix Jackson, a little African-American lady in the, the countryside in Mississippi who must take a very long walk through the woods to get some medicine for her uh, little grandson, and if he doesn't get the medicine, he will die. And so it's the story of her journey, which becomes a mythic journey as different little creatures come and people speak to her. And at one point, somebody gives her a piece of cake and all kinds of things as she as she makes this incredible mythic journey. And I was just spellbound. I never even heard anything like this. And so um, she. She finished reading the story with her lilting delivery and finished it. And she said, well, any questions? And that just like a little bird, any questions? And, uh, 
everybody had put up their hand and there was one boy in the back it was just waving like this, you know, and he had all this long hair. This was the 60s, but we weren't having it yet, the 60s. And, you know, this long hair and everything. And so he was just waving like this, and so she, of course, called on him. And he said, Miss Welty, I just wonder, I just want to ask you one question. He said, in, your, in this beautiful story, A Warren Path, how did you come upon that perfect symbol when the person gives... Uh, Phoenix Jackson, the cake, the marble cake. He said, the perfect symbol of yin and yang. You know, and he made these yin yang symbols, and the male and the female principle, and you know, the other and the, well, I don't know what. Anyway, he was saying all this stuff and making his hands go like this. You know, we're all kind of looking at him, and she said, well, he said, how did you come, up, come upon this symbol, this wonderful symbol? And she said, well, it's a recipe that's been in my family for years. <laughs> and I just loved it because my mother made the best marble cake in Grundy, Virginia. And somehow, I don't know, somehow I began to see that perhaps some other things from Grundy, Virginia might possibly be the subject of not only fiction, but maybe really good fiction. And some of these things that I had thought were just not, not to be written about. You know, I wanted to have a black turtleneck and, you know, live in France. And then I thought, kept thinking of stories from Grundy, you know, people that I'd known, things that I might put in a story. And so I think that's, a, a, that's one of the great functions of, you know, of reading or particularly of, you know, having the kind of, kind of, education that we were lucky enough to have here at Hollins to just for for us to find our own material, you know, because I just that just changed my mind forever. And of course I went out and read every word she ever wrote. And uh, then wrote a couple of very simple stories, which were much better than all those stories I've been getting C plus on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I'll read you I'll close by reading one tiny little thing, again, this from this book, there's the Eudora Wealthy thing is in here, and then there's also an essay named Big River, which is about the raft trip that I took with a whole bunch of uh, other Hollands girls down the Mississippi River, 1,200 miles, right, from Paducah, Kentucky to New Orleans. All right, and I won't, it, it would take too long to, to go into that whole, whole thing. I was already at that time, of course, um, writing. And I was the keeper of the log on that raft. And I, I kept the log. And um, it was a wonderful, wonderful trip. Um, let me just read you a little bit from this. Um, let's see. I don't even know where to start. It, it, it's, it's all about how we, you know, how when we decided in class that we would do this and how we equipped the raft and made some money and all this stuff. Um, and we were always singing because I think girls from Holland tend to sing. But anyway, <laughs> we painted we painted rosebuds all over the raft and sang goodbye Paducah to the tune of Hello Dolly as we left. <laughs> In fact, we sang relentlessly all the time, all the way down the Mississippi. We sang in spite of our mishaps and travails, the tale of a hurricane that hit us before we even got to Cairo, as they call it, spelled Cairo, Illinois, sending the temperature down below 40 degrees and driving us onto the rocks, a diet consisting almost entirely of tuna and donuts. This is because we made some ad advertisements for King of the Sea tuna and some kind of donuts, and so they gave us all this Donuts and tuna. So anyway, <laughs> the captain, our captain was 76 years old. He had emerged from a rest home in, in Paducah to lead us down the river <laughs> because the, the U.S. Army, whatever they are, river patrol people, would not let us go without a riverboat captain. That was a good idea on their part. <laughs> And so we cried and cried, and we were featured on television. 
crying because we were, there was their boat and we couldn't go. We were ready to crack the champagne, we couldn't get on. Then crying some more. And then um, evening news, morning news. And then the door of this retirement home on the blank banks of the river, you know, the Ohio River at that point, you know, opened and the Captain Gordon S. Cooper, 76 years old, came out in his white outfit and his big straw hat and held a press conference and he said, I will take the girls down the river. <laughs> so he did. Anyway, here we go. Um, uh, let's see, we went, had mosquito bites beyond belief, rainstorms that soaked everything we owned despite the useless tarp. If anything really bad happened to us, we figured we could call up our parents' collect and they would come and fix things. We expected to be taken care of. Nobody at that age, that age, had ever suggested to us that we might ever have to make a living or that somebody wouldn't marry us and then look after us for the rest of our lives. We all smoked cigarettes. We were all cute. We headed down that river with absolute confidence that we would get where we were going. We worked and fished and played cards and talked and talked and talked. It was wonderful. Uh, then I go on. In between stints as cook and keeper of the ship log, I was writing my own first novel. I had it all outlined, and every day I sat down with a yellow pad and wrote a little bit of it. In creative writing class, I had learned how plot works. Beginning, middle, and end. Conflict, complication, and resolution. Why not? <laughs> okay. Um, in all my yellow newspaper clippings from that trip, the press refers to us as girls such as Girls I Go Go on the Mississippi. Today, of course, they call us women, but we were the last girls. In 1966, a lot of things were changing for good, though we didn't know it yet. More possibilities and opportunities for women would bring greater expectations and responsibilities, along with the lack of both illusion and stability. Whatever happened to romance, for instance, or the sacred 50s family? Over the years, many people asked me when I was going to write about the raft trip. It seemed like such a natural. While we'd been famous at the time, appearing nationally on Huntley Brinkley, covered by every TV station up and down the river and every newspaper in the South, a three-column close-up photograph of me had appeared on the front page of the Memphis Commercial Appeal, wearing a bandana on my head, cut-off jeans, my Rosebud Hobson t-shirt, and a big grin, smoking a cigarette. When somebody sent this clipping to my mother, she went to bed. <laughs> I was clearly having the time of my life. We all were. But this was the problem. This is why the raft trip was not a natural for fiction, even though the journey is, of course, an archetypal plot for a novel or story. But taking a trip, even the best trip in the world, which that one was, with the best companions is not enough. Fact is, we had a great time on the raft, period. And that was not a story. But years passed because it didn't have any conflict. Wow, we were just having a good time. But years passed, and then many years passed, and I attended my 30th Collins reunion, where I was stunned by all our lives. We were divorced, we were gay, we were running large companies, we were living alone on an island, we were dealing with cancer, mental illness, aging parents, children who had not grown up as we had expected, some of us had already died, including Nimsy Speed, who had been on the raft with us. Another woman on that trip had simply disappeared. There was a big difference between our youthful expectations and the reality of our lives, between the girls we had been and the women we had become. Suddenly, I had plenty of conflict, brought to us by the simple passage of life itself. Not long after that reunion, a tipsy book club member about my age buttonholed me at a literary festival someplace in the South. Why do you keep writing about old mountain women? <laughs> she demanded. <laughs> Why don't you write about us? Her question hit me with the force of revelation. Okay, 
I thought, okay, time to get back on that raft. So I wrote a novel named The Last Girls, taking the trip but making up all the, the characters. And um, it was so much fun. Anyway, um, it was uh, in the novel, a tragedy has brought four of the original rafters, girls, now middle-aged, back together for a repeat voyage on a very different kind of craft, you know, the Bell of Natchez, one of those big steamships. And these women are all carrying a lot of psychological baggage from their past while dealing, of course, with the kinds of unresolved conflicts we all have in our lives. And I, what I was trying to do was examine the idea of romance, the relevance of past or presence, and the theme of memory and desire. Which, which Richard Diller taught us, is we, he had us reading Nabokov, who said the only thing worth writing about is memory and desire. Remember that? I never forgot that. Okay, so here's the end. This is the end of my reading. This is the last paragraph um, of this little essay. For me, and for most of us on the real raft, I suspect, it was the only journey I ever made that ended as it was supposed to. Subsequent trips have been harder, scarier. We have been shipwrecked. We have foundered on hidden shoals. We have lost our running lights. And the captain is dead. I can't stick to a traditional plot anymore. I've got plenty of conflict, plenty of complication, but no resolutions in sight. Such a plot, the historic quest and conquer, may have been more suited to boys' books anyway. Certainly, the linear, beginning, middle, end plot, that form doesn't fit the lives of any women I know, for life has turned out to be wild and various, full of the unexpected, and it's a monstrous big river out here. Thank you. Thank you. My gratitude list just got longer. Um, you made me laugh, you made me cry. You've really sort of done this, but I, I did want to see if I could get one more Holland story, if you've got it, out of each of you. Maybe something that happened at the dining hall or front quad. That, um, yeah, why not the dining hall? That's where the action is, right? Um, that, that showed up as material in a poem or an essay or a story or a novel. Or, or shape the way you look at writing. Does anything come to mind for either of you? Natasha. That is so hard. Yeah, that's a Just topic. because my time here was so wonderful, it's hard to even figure out um, mm -hmm. the moments of it. But I guess I could tell the part that ends with the story about you that I told up there, yeah. because that's... There, Everyone I had to, would be in I had to get there. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I, I, I briefly said that I, I came here with this idea that I was going to write stories um, because I love short stories. And um, I had at that time Marianne Ginger was here and she was my fiction professor. And I, I was really a horrible storyteller. I think for some of the reasons that, you know, Lee just told. I, I, I couldn't figure out, you know, the conflict and the complications. A thing that makes so much sense to me in poetry. There's something about the way a poem moves that I can, I can figure that out there, but I couldn't figure it out in a prose narrative. Um, but I was certain that I couldn't write a poem. And I was certain of that because um, when I was a college student, when I was 19 and my mother was killed, the first thing I did was try to write a poem, I mean, which is something that a lot of us do. We, we turn to poetry um, in moments of grief because we think it's the, the one language that can sort of speak to that kind of loss. And it was a horrible poem, so 
uh, amateur, I, I wrote that I felt like I was sinking into an ocean of despair, and sinking went down the page one letter at a time like that. <laughs> and it pulled in that little uh, ocean of despair at the bottom, that little trite uh, puddle. And um, so this is like the most I sort of uh, thought about poetry at the time. By the time I got to Holland's and this particular moment, I'd been in Jean's contemporary literature class, poetry class. I was reading a lot more poetry. And a friend of mine, uh, who was a poet in the program, dared me to write a poem. And I decided to take the dare in order to prove how bad a poet I was. <laughs> <laughs> but because I'd been reading so much poetry by then, um, it was a much better poem. And by the way, it was a poem called uh, One of Them, uh, which is kind of, I know that that'll sound creepy to you because you know that there's that scene in uh, One of Us, One of Us. But I, this poem called One of Them, but it was, it was my first poem examining my own um, uh, biracial and black heritage. Um, so it was me sort of finding my material and finding it in a poem. So once I wrote it, I, I stuck it in uh, Marianne Ganger's mailbox. And the next time I saw her, she came running down the hall saying, oh, Tasha, you're a poet. Now then, I was certain it was because I was such a bad fiction writer that she was trying to give me <laughs> some kind of encouragement. But at that moment, I, I really never looked back. And that's when Jean said, well, if you're going to write poetry, then you're going to bring me two new poems every week, and we're going to talk about them. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have read your stories, and um, you're a little harder on them. <laughs> you got that one. See, yeah. I keep getting worried so, all yeah. these years it's, later. I'm still waiting. <laughs> I just think that it's one of the most important functions of any teacher or any literature writing program, or, or for the for the writing student, is um, for you to be introduced to a writer, to read somebody's work that you really resonate with. I mean, it's almost like I feel like, um, as a teacher myself, it's like Match.com. You know, I mean, I'm trying to match up a young a young writing student or a new new writer with um, with a, an established writer that I feel like has got a whole lot to say to that writer. Like I had a student, young student in the Appalachian writing program, Silas Hacks from Eastern Kentucky. And Silas was in a, was in a writing, summer writing program and he was so good, but he had such reverence because nobody in his family had graduated from, a, a couple were illiterate, no people had graduated from college or anything. and so. He thought that to write, he had to write in a very elevated kind of way, a sort of a very, because he respected the language so much. But what he was writing about was a very uh, nitty gritty kind of upbringing that he had had there in Eastern Kentucky. And so the language was, so I gave him Larry Brown to read. You know, it's like Larry Brown for whom the term grit lip was invented, you know. And I gave him Larry Brown to read. And he, uh, and about that time, uh, the novel that I'd given him was reviewed in the New York Times. And the writer in the New York Times said, Mr. Brown's characters are the sort with whom one would never dine. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, and Silas said, I said that to Silas too. And Silas wrote back to me and he said, he said, hell, I've been having supper with these people all my life. <laughs> exactly what happened to me in the Eudora Wellesley story that I had already told. It was like uh, the language in that story and in all of her stories is very simple and she writes about families and people and rural characters and just very elemental kinds of things and, and the kind of thing really that I had grown up with where my, uh, my county in the mountain south was not much different from rural Mississippi in terms of the kinds of people and the kinds of experiences that they might have had. And so, you know, so they, I got from Holland, I, I got an understanding, I think, of how important as a teacher, you know, it is to, to get the students to read the right thing and so on. 
Match.com. I've, yes. I've got my card. <laughs> That'll be happening. Well, I was thinking one thing that you have in common besides your amazing ability to do things with words is the way that in your writing you often start with or work out of something that's intensely personal, that's really grounded in memory, in your own experience, and then the work moves to something that is shared with the reader and with a whole range of, of different human experiences. And I'm wondering how that happens in your head or on the page, how you get from this is my story or a piece of my story that I might be fictionalizing to something that makes other people say either, oh, now I get what it's like to be there, or, oh yeah, I've always known that. I just didn't know how I knew. How does that magical thing happen? Accidentally? <laughs> Inadvertently? I remember, okay, this is going to sound like the Jeannie Larson show, so forgive me. Oh, but, <laughs> but, but, but the, you know, I remember uh, in that uh, contemporary poetry class, there was a moment where we were probably looking at Adrienne Rich's poems. Yeah. Um, and you, I remember you sort of talking about the feminist movement and you know what we take from the feminist movement that um, the personal is political. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I, you know, on my own sort of journey to figuring out how I was going to write about the personal, which um, seemed so small in some ways, or so intimate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My grief seemed intimate, um, even though the elegy has a long tradition. I still couldn't think of my own grief as worthy of the big grand elegies. Um, I couldn't think of my own experience as somehow worthy of some larger thing than myself. And then I began to think about how uh, the personal is also historical. And the historical is deeply personal. And so from that, it's the way that I started, um, because I didn't want to be ever accused of being one of those navel-gazing poets. Um, so I decided to look outward. Um, I decided to look at history and find my way back into the personal through the historical. And so that's how I do it again and again. It's, you know, sometimes it goes the other way around, but for me, I have to look at history in order to sort of make sense of, of myself within it. Mm -hmm. It shows up in, in your books so wonderfully oh, yeah. the way the book as a whole moves back and forth in a different way each time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what's going on with these Grundy stories that turn <laughs> Well, I don't know, but I do think that um, there came a time in, in, you know, 50 years of writing fiction or whatever, when you do use up your own life. Mm. You know, what you hope if you're writing anything <laughs> of value is that what you have to say about your own life will apply to other people and their lives and their experiences. I mean, that's what you have to assume and hope. But I, I came to a time when I felt that I had really used up my life. Mm -hmm. And so then, uh, you know, which goes against what every creative writing teacher tells you, which is write what you know. Well, you can get sick of what you know, too. <laughs> you know, and so then I moved to history. Exactly the same thing, you know. And I, for instance, I wrote a, a long um, historical novel about, um, you know, the Civil War, which I had ever been interested in. But suddenly we moved to a old, very old house in a very old town with the Civil War history, and I wrote the Civil War novel, and I learned all this and learned all that, and somehow it was a very personal experience for me, though, because that, that history is so strong, um, and I was reading all the Civil War diaries and letters and stuff, and such an amazing body of writing, very charged, that somehow my character became very, very personal for me. Or Appalachian history, you know, going way back in time. And I wrote a book named Fair and Tender Ladies. And in that, about to honor the lives of all these old ladies I'd known, I did lots and lots of research about life, you know, in the 19th century and the early 20th century. And it became very personal for me. You know, and I think readers have a personal relationship with that novel. And I don't know why. I don't know why, but you can... Well, will you do that? Get out of yourself and, and write more, write better about yourself. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how to say that. Yeah. There's a lot to be said for lying. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also, you have made me feel, when I, I felt like I knew Grundy before I went there. 
And then I went there and the Grundy I saw was after the big flood oh, project. Yeah. Very different. That you describe in, in Dinosaur. Yeah. But I feel like I have both Grundies now. Yeah. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I sort of said I wasn't, since I know everyone here reads books and buys books, not everyone writes them, so I wasn't going to ask you a lot of writer questions, but I, I need to ask one. Um, so this morning I made a quick list of 21st century alums who are publishing books in good places. Um, and just because I thought it would be yeah, good for right. me to do. But when I was doing so, it was a great list, but I got reminded of people who actually got their Hollis degrees in, say, the early 90s, but their first books came out like 20 years later. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. to great success, but that was a long haul for those folks, I, I know it. So do you have advice for writers, maybe particularly those who are beginning, but for any writers, about dealing with those glum moments when you don't get the award or the rejection email comes or the agent doesn't bother to write, whatever it is, how do you keep going in the face of self-doubt? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fine. <laughs> the masses are waiting. <laughs> well, okay, I'll try. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was, I mean, I, well, I was older than you when I was here because you were here as an undergraduate. Yeah. And I guess I came here, I was 24. Um, but I was still so naive um, about um, publishing and what any of that meant. And so I was just excited about writing. Um, I can't imagine as I try to think about it, I'm sort of you know, getting emotional thinking about it, but I just needed to do it. Yeah. Um, I wasn't thinking about po-biz, I wasn't, you know, the whole business of it. Um, I think that there's something about trying to keep that, that naivete, but also trying to, to still write because you have to, because um, um, what else would you do? I, um, I'll stop because I know I can't. <laughs> I'm trying to think about my father. Um, we took this photograph um, many years ago when I was just starting out because we walked by this giant mailbox, giant, just regular kind of the kind of mailbox people have at their houses. And so we opened, it was bigger than our heads, and we opened it, and we stuck both of our faces in it, and we were sort of, you know, with our faces peering into this empty mailbox, which is sort of the, the way it used to be when, you know, you actually sent off your poems or your stories, <laughs> and, and then you waited them, for them to come back in the mail. Um, so it was sort of this image of like the writer's life of waiting for something to arrive in that mailbox. Yeah. But it was also a, a very exciting. There, there was also there was always anticipation and possibility. And my father um, taught me. Um, this is sort of another sort of Holland story, but this is something that he he would have taught to all of his students. I know he did. Um, to make a list of uh, where you send your work to. So he, he told this story about the notebook that he kept and that when he would send a poem out to a place, he'd write the name of the poem and the magazine and the date that he sent it and he would wait for it to come back in the mail uh, either with an acceptance or a rejection and he would sort of draw a line through it, check it off wherever you know, it came from. And the great story that he told was um, you know, getting into a, a fight in a bar. If you, if you knew my father, you, you would know that this is not an unusual occurrence <laughs> um, when he was a young man in New Orleans and writing a poem called Central Lockup about this, uh, this, uh, this fight and getting locked up. And he was at Tulane then. And the poem um, won an Academy of American Poets Prize uh, that he, when he submitted it as a student which gave him this great big confidence. Uh, you know, he's going to send the poem out and, and publish it somewhere. So he decided that he was going to send it to the Kenyon Review. So he writes one, Kenyon Review, and he sends it, and then it comes back. And so then he writes two, and he sends it out to the next place. And he goes through all of these magazines, uh, increasingly lesser magazines, you know, what my father would call the dipshit magazines. <laughs> They rejected it. It just came back again and again and again. And he never gave up. 
On the hundredth try, he sent it back to the Kenyan Review. <laughs> and they took it. <laughs> so the writing comes first. But be a little bit bullheaded. Okay. Yeah. Well, if you're doing it because you have to, yeah. then you stick to it, yeah. no matter what's coming back or not yeah. coming back in the mail. Yeah. yeah. You want someone to read it. Great. Great. Yeah, I've had. I mean, I, I, I really, I think, write for myself. You know, and I mean, if it get, I have a lot of stuff that hasn't been published. Some of it I don't even send out. I mean, for me, I'll read it. Publication, <laughs> publication is maybe the last reason to write, you know, and this, there's a famous quote, I think, by Henry Taylor, which is, I never know what I think till I read what I've written. Yeah. You, know, I'm, you know, I'm very sort of unaware, kind of psychologically unaware sort of person, and it just helps me to, to clarify, you know, whether I'm writing fiction or nonfiction or whatever, you know, it, it just helps me to work through things I've got in my mind in my, or have happened in my family, all kinds of, you know, all kinds of things, and I've done it you know, all my life, and it's just very helpful. Another quote I love is Ann Tyler said, um, which reminds me of when I used up my own life and had to think of something else to say. So, um, and one of Ann Tyler's great quotes is, I write because I want to have more than one life. You know, and that's true, because we can imagine, when we write fiction, we can imagine being other people living other lives, living in a manner, in a time, in a place very unlike our own. And we get to do that research, which I just love. And I mean, you know, I think for that reason, I've, you know, gotten to be many more people than myself. You know, I've gotten to be housewives and whores and then soldiers on a battlefield and just all kinds of people that I would never have had the experience of being and you know it's it's just it's been a great life I gotta say yeah the great several lives yeah the great several lives <laughs> this is probably a major personality disorder <laughs> <laughs> but anyway the writing kind of keeps me in the road I have to say but you have both let the people with the disorder know something about keeping on thank you so I'm going to ask one last question I'm going to give each of you about ninety seconds or so to answer because we are running short on time. Yeah. Um, Natasha, I'm going to shake Adam York in that interview with you. So you, you really want me to cry then. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> not, sweetie, I'm sorry. But, but this is, you used the phrase in an interview with him that you did back in 2010, I think, psychological geography. You mm -hmm. were talking about Atlanta. Um, and I think, when I think of all, all of your work, Lee, I think about the kind of landscapes mm -hmm. that you have given us. And, and what I'm wondering is, for this is for readers as well as writers, mm -hmm. um, is our psychological, are our psychological realities an immovable given, or can we reshape them, can we reframe them, can we shift the t topography a little? 90 seconds, what you got? <laughs> well, I think we can, can. no, I think we can, and I think one, raise, one way we can do it is by writing. Mm -hmm. Is by writing, you know, uh, I mentioned you during wealthy, and I am reminded of the, the night uh, Medgar Evers was killed, and she immediately sat down and wrote a short story from the point of view of the person she imagined might have shot him, lived from living in Mississippi and knowing the kind of people in rural Mississippi that she had known. She did that just immediately, and much later when it turned out who had done it, it was this total psychological profile, you know, it just fit. Personally, so I think it's a. a she made it. okay. Yes, I agree. I mean, and because I have written a lot of poems that are about trauma, about childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. um, when you're the child experiencing the traumatic event, you're not in control of it. But when you're the adult writing a poem, you're absolutely mm -hmm. in control mm -hmm. of the craft, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the making of the poem, mm -hmm. and that is. Joyous. I mean, that changes that sort of psychological geography from something that was devastating to, in the words of Percy Bysshe Shelley, uh, poems are records of the best and happiest times and the happiest and best minds. So even poems about trauma and difficulty, when I'm making them, I am the happiest and best mind. Perfect. All right, we end with joy. <laughs>
said that the personal is all, always historical, and that's a lot about this weekend. It's about history, it's about her stories, it's about us. Thank you for making a wonderful afternoon. And I encourage everyone to see not the history, but the present of Hollis at 315 in what many of us call the Fishburn Library, now the Weatherall Visual Arts Center, which is worth seeing if you have it. We're going to have a panel of current students, and I think you will find them exceptional and really a window in to what is Hollis today. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend.